Hello everyone, I am That Williams Guy, and if you are a regular uh, participant of the episodes here, you are familiar with the fact that we like to focus in on the historical context and the evolution of firearms training. Well, joining us tonight is someone who is riding off into the sunset of, of that historical context, and that is Mr. Dave Spalding. How are you doing, Dave? I am doing well, Lee. Yourself? I am doing, I'm rolling. I'm getting to talk to you. So oh, thank I, you. Yeah. I had to get the tombstone reference in for you. Oh yeah, but everybody knows I'm a old west fan, so to speak. So yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, Dave. If we would tell everyone how you got started in firearms training, what was your career? Uh, I spent 35 years in law enforcement at various agencies, uh, a wide variety of assignments. As a matter of fact. I think at one point or another, I did everything, every position in my former agency. Um, I started out dispatching cars, worked the floors of the jail, did court security, uh, patrol, uh, investigations, undercover operations. I was in SWAT, um, was a full-time trainer. And then I did many of those same functions as a, a sergeant, a supervisor, and then again, many of those same functions and units as a command officer, as a lieutenant. So I got a wide variety of experiences that um, I like to say I've drawn upon in, in how I developed my, my firearms training. Excellent. Um, when did you go to the academy? 1976. I was five years old. Thank you for that. <laughs> And for the, I turned 50 last week. So that puts it in kind of some context there. I'll be 67. There you go. Uh, what was your issued weapon when you went to the academy? Wasn't an issued weapon. You could buy off a list of approved weapons. My first revolver, the gun I went through the academy with was a four inch model 28 Smith and Wesson. Uh, I realized fairly quickly that that gun was too large for my hand. And I went to a model 19. I stayed with the Model 19 and still stainless steel was approved in the 1980s. Then I went to a Model 66. When pistols were approved, my first one was a 469 Smith & Wesson. And then since that time, I think I've carried every make and many models of various semi-automatic pistols to include Smith, Sig, HK, Glock, um, pretty much all of those. So what was firearms training like in the academy? <laughs> it really wasn't much as much firearms training as it was a course of instruction to get you to pass the practical pistol course, the PPC. You and I both know it's a wonderful pastime. It's a good competition. It has very little to do with firearms training. So that 40-hour block of instruction was all directed at getting you the skills you needed to at the end of the training block to pass the PPC. So we did, uh, you know, like a prone shooting at 60 yards and kneeled shooting at 50 and what we used to call barricade shooting. It wasn't used to cover, it was a barricade. You know, you put your hand up on it and you laid your, your revolver in the crook of your, of your thumb and you shot your six rounds. Uh, your close quarter shooting was done at 15 feet. That was all shot from a locked in hip and you jumped back and forth trying to align. It, it was, it had nothing to do with gunfighting, nothing whatsoever. And while you were participating in this training, did you think that this was preparing you to go on the street or did you know right from the bat something's wrong here? I knew nothing about gunfighting other than 1960s television. So, but I knew that this was not it. Um, and what I did that actually kind of changed my life, it changed the path and how I was, uh, how I was to look at this is I was visiting my father. My father was a veteran of Iwo Jima, so he understood a little bit about conflict. And I made a statement to him that to him was no big deal. To me, it was a life changer. I said, I wished I could talk to someone who had been in a gunfight. He didn't even look away from the television set. He said, son, go down to the Legion Hall. There's lots of them. You know, World War II had only been over 30 years. Th those guys were younger than I am now. So off to the Legion Hall, I went. And after they busted my chops for a little while because I had long hair and a must, you know, the 1970s, they sat me down next to a gentleman who I thought was about 400 years old. 
probably was in his early 70s, not much older than I am now, but he was a veteran of the trench and tunnel warfare of World War I. For an hour and a half, he sat there and explained to me what his experiences were. He had tears running out of his eyes and his beer glass when he would, he would shake like this as he would try to sip from it. And when he finished, I said, whoa, I'm not ready for even a small part of what that was all about. And it literally started me on a journey that's lasted until just the last couple of years where I've gone out and tried to interview everybody I could that had been in armed conflict. It didn't matter if it was military or law enforcement. There wasn't many armed citizens back in those days. But I did interview more than my share of felons because felons have a viewpoint on gunfighting that is ignored by an awful lot of people. But since over the last almost 40 years, I've, I've literally spoken to hundreds of people. And the feedback I got from those interviews, plus my own experiences in law enforcement, and no, I didn't stack up bodies like a special forces operator. I was a cop. We police society. We're not at war with, with the citizens that we police. But I, I had a few experiences. I know what it's like to be in peril. And I combined a lot of that kind of information along with my background in sports physiology. And that led to a lot of how I do things and what I called handgun combatants, which was the term for my methodology before it became the name of my company. Uh, I got to point out for the people that are listening to this episode rather than viewing it, the glass that Dave shook just a second ago when he was, was doing his illustration there has an orange gun sight logo on it. And if you go back to the episode with Shane Gosa, you'll, you'll know the symbology of the orange gun sight. I think I'm going back to Gunsight March. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to go back. And I'd like to go one more time before I get too old. I'm kind of trying to try and I'm trying to work out the, the logistics of that. When was your first trip to Gunsight? Sheriff Jim Wilson was a young guy. <laughs> I'd want to say mid 1980s. Okay. And was that training yeah. directly with Cooper? Uh, no. Uh, he had his range masters there. He was on site. I got to go over to his house and visit with him. That was the first time I got a chance to sit down with, with Colonel Cooper. Okay. He actually invited me into the sconce and we went down into the spiral staircase and down into his little room. And uh, I spent about four or five hours with him. Who were the range masters for that class? Oh, for crying out loud. I may have this wrong, but I want to say it was Giles and Ed Stock. There you go. That's yeah. pretty good company. Very good company. Very yeah. good company. And so how quickly was that after your conversation with the gentleman at the Legion? Oh, that would have been in late 1976. So we're probably talking 14, 15 years. Okay. All right. So after you had the conversation with that gentleman at the Legion, where did you end your, you started doing your interviews where did your training path take you where you started actually trying to learn things? Well, you, you've got to keep in mind, Lee, even though I had my own thoughts about these things, there was doctrine that was adopted by the state of Ohio as well as my agency. And you kind of had to follow that methodology, the, the, the range master, which is a term I'm not a big fan of because I'm not sure we're a master of the range. But the lead firearms instructor for my agency had very strong opinions about things. And you know how that is. So you mm -hmm. kind of went along with it. We started out with, you know, the uh, Sykes Applegate type point shooting where you pointed a lot from the hip, you know, did a lot of that jack handle, lift the gun up kind of kind of shooting. And it wasn't too long after that, that we made a massive transition to the modern technique of the pistol and the hard weaver stance. If anybody thinks that those two are like and similar, they're, they're mistaken because I, I literally had to undo an entire shooting system and adopt a new shooting system. And anybody that understands motor performance and function will understand that that's a long process if you want to try to get that to automaticity, which is the level you need to 
be at if you're going to use that without conscious thought in a gunfight. So those, those were long processes. And we were right in that modern technique of the pistol when I went to gun site. So even though I had learned that from local people, going out to gun site and talking to Colonel Cooper and experience it there did help me get a better understanding of where it came from. Because as you well know, there's a lot of people out there that instruct things that really don't know why. Right. They don't know the history behind it. They don't know the cause, the reason, the effect. They just, this is what they learned, so they passed it on. And it's actually a dangerous precedent, but it's very common in firearms training. Yeah, I remember in the academy, them preaching the, you know, the four cardinal rules of firearm safety to us. And then they taught us a low ready that broke those rules. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, you just told me that I'm not allowed to point the firearm at someone that I don't intend to shoot, but you're telling me that this low ready thing, I I'm pointed at, at him, but I don't intend to shoot him. So which one of these is correct? And well, that's, that's the difference between the guard and what later became the classic low ready, which is pointing at the ground right in front of your feet. So, and of course, you know what happened is the gun got heavy. It became no ready because people right. really were pointing the gun at their own feet and their own legs. Right. So there is uh, one of the classic examples of inconsistency. So you said your agency was undergoing a switch to the modern technique. What prompted that in your agency? The chief firearms instructor went off to school went off to a school at the state training academy and they were pushing the modern technique at the time. And so he brought it back. You know, I learned this at school, thus I bring it back to you. It, I mean, that's how it's been done for a long time. Yeah. You know, so. All right. Uh, in addition to going to gun site, where else did you seek training back in that same time period? My first organized training class away from my agency was probably about 1980. It was John Farnham. And he came uh, to Ohio to, to do a two-day class. And so uh, I had a training course with him. And then we had a very progressive, real innovative instructor at our state training academy, but a fellow by the name of Bill Gross. And so I sought a lot of training. Every course he taught at the state training academy, I went there. And then there was uh, Masada Yub, of course, Ken Hackathorns from Ohio. So, you know, a lot of stuff from Ken was a, was a factor in, in how I went about things. Um, uh, boy, I'm just trying to think of all of the people I've, I've gone to. Um, when I became a firearms instructor, it was because my SWAT team needed one. I went on SWAT and we founded it in 1980 and it, they realized very quickly we needed our own instructor. So I started the firearms instructor process, which was a week of revolver, a week of pistol, a week of, of carbine, a week of submachine gun and, and a week of uh, shotgun, a week of instructional skills. You had to do all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I, you know what, I, I would probably have to break out my, my training record to give you the list. The last time I checked, Lee, it was six pages long, single spaced. That was yeah. just firearms. That didn't include all the other stuff. Yeah, it's interesting that you, you mentioned Ken Hackathorn. And, you know, people that came along like when I did in the open enrollment circuit 2014 and such and moving forward, you know, we look at Mr. Hackathorn, you know, venerated, you know, legendary guy. How was he perceived back then? Was he just another guy from this other agency? Or was like, this guy's got something going on. We need to be no, paying attention. No, because he was a founding member of IPSIC and stuff like that, he was considered uh, at a higher level. He was considered what I think of as a national level instructor versus a regional or a local firearms trainer. He was definitely one of the high level. You know, he was one of the original gun site instructors right. and stuff like that. But uh, no, uh, because of Ken's affiliation with like the FBI, HRT and you know, doing a lot of stuff from federal government. I know he did a lot of training for Delta in their early phases. He was definitely considered a, a cut above what everybody else was doing. Yeah, one of the things Gary Greco has talked about was you know, that the two things that drive change 
and innovation are pivotal events and influential people. And so right. yeah, I think you're kind of lucky to have had someone like him there in Ohio that was being paid attention to. Well, yeah, I mean, everybody was definitely paying attention to him. What a lot of people didn't realize is he wasn't a full time cop. You know, he uh, he couldn't, you know, trying to raise a family, he just couldn't make it as a uh, as a law enforcement officer. So he went into the private sector, but he was out there all the time, you know, doing training, taking training, trying to be innovative. The, the one thing I like about Ken Hackathorn, and I will always give him accolades for, is that every time I was around him or hooked up with him or got a chance to talk with him, he was not bashful about saying, I don't do it that way anymore. I do it this way now. And then he would explain to you why he changed. He was never afraid to change. How many people do you know, Lee, are still doing things the same way 20, 25, 30 years later because they can't change because their entire personality is based on how they go about this? And let's face it, we evolve, we adapt, we change. And Ken was one of those guys that was never afraid to change, never afraid to tell you why. And um, we were talking about mentors earlier, and he would certainly be one of one of my big mentors. Cool. Um, I guess we're also in the same era of Newhall happening. Was that something you were aware of in Ohio? Yes. Yes. You know, it was it was before I went on law enforcement, it was the early 70s. I can't remember the exact time, but it was something that was talked about. And as you know, there was a lot of misinformation about that. You know, guys dying with cartridge cases in their pockets and stuff like that. It was probably the first example, or at least the first example I know of, where we changed the narrative of what happened to meet what we want to teach. So elaborate that, on that. I, I've got to, I've got to hear that. That's happened a lot. Well, you know, the idea that, you know, you dump your cartridge cases on the ground, you don't put mm -hmm. them in your, your hand and put them in uh, your pocket because we don't want to dirty up the range. Well, you know, that was something that I think was made up by people, but it really never happened. The new hall incident, the new hall incidents, just what they quoted right. to make their point. I was told that same thing in the Academy in 1999. That, that same thing. There were still two agencies. I went to a regional academy that served 10 counties and then all the yeah. municipalities in those 10 counties. Yeah. And they were still telling us that we, we had two agencies that were still uh, revolver primary. Mm -hmm. And so I got to hear all the revolver talk. And part of Georgia's qualification course back then for revolver shooters was there was a stage where they uh, had to, from the ready, fire one shot each on two targets, eject all the empties in their gun, and then manually reload two rounds. They couldn't use a speed loader or a speed stripper. They had to manually reload two rounds, index the cylinder properly, and come back up and fire two more rounds. And that was what they told us was a stem from Newhall. It's because this officer got killed, kneeled down behind his car loading, and you need to be able to get your revolver back into action quickly. Well, it, he was killed because he was, if I remember correctly, he was killed because it took so long to load out of his dump pouch right. where you dump six rounds into your hand and then you had to finagle him to get him in place. Mm -hmm. My understanding is from people who are smarter about the that, that incident than I am, had he had a speed loader, that wouldn't have happened. Right. So it wasn't because he dumped four loaded two. I mean, let's right. face it, that, that would get you killed. Right. The, well, the what they were trying to do that is unbelievable yeah what they were trying to teach us was if you you know just get two rounds back in the gun and get back in the fight versus trying to sit there and get all six back in if you were manually loading and which i, I think has some validity but why not just use a speed loader but we know that now their agency didn't allow it then well we you you have to look at a bigger thing than get two back two rounds back in the gun mm -hmm. you have to look at whether i dump live rounds and load six from a speed loader, which of those activities takes my eyes off the threat longer? I mean, I think I would rather dump those two live rounds and put six mm -hmm. in it and be able to keep my head up and see what's going on than right. worry about saving two rounds. Right. Uh, you know, well, so the, way, the way the seven yard line started is you were loaded with six and you would draw and fire two right, two left, and then you would go to ready. 
And then on the next signal, you come up fire one and one, which you were empty at that point. Okay. And you had to go. Now, for those of us, like my agency was issuing semi-automatic pistols, which we'd only been doing four or five years at that point. Um, I shot a Smith 4006 in the Academy. We had to have a magazine with two rounds in it so that it would all even out. And so we would come up fire one and one, reload with that two round magazine, one and one, and you'd stand there for another eight seconds while the revolver guys you know, we're, we're getting finished. That's a clue, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's a clue. You know, the funny thing about semi-automatic pistols is that when they first, we first went to them about 1986, I wrote the proposal. I was assigned to write the proposal to make that happen, but I wasn't an advocate. When we formed our SWAT team in 1980, we started out with revolvers, but Within a couple of years, we've got authorization to use 1911s. Only when we were doing SWAT, but we could carry the 1911. And I didn't have a lot of luck with the 1911. Now, don't misunderstand. I like the 1911. I, the guns back then were not the guns of today. We didn't have the springage and the reliability and all that stuff down like we do now. And the 1911s I own did not inspire a lot of confidence on my part as far as the semi-automatic pistol. So when I wrote the proposal for the Smith & Wesson semi-automatic pistol, I did it with a heavy heart because I wasn't an advocate. I had to be shown that it was a, a better idea. And it was things like just what you're talking about that made me realize, yeah, this is the way to go. Uh, of course, you know, these, these things are reliable. They're faster to reload. You can I mean, let's, let's face it. The only thing you can do if you have a stoppage with a revolver is press the trigger again. Right. If that don't work, it's going to the gunsmith. Pistol, you can tap racket, get it back into action. Yep. So those things made me realize this was the way to go. You know, of course, as you were telling that, that you use the 1911 and SWAT and the revolver otherwise, that conjures up images of Hondo in his Class A uniform jumping in the back of the bread truck and jumping out in a flight suit with a 1911. We looked a lot like Hondo. We had one piece <laughs> jump shoots, ball caps, um, Ruger Mini 14s, 870s, and revolvers. And oh, and a former UPS truck. Yep. And that's what we started with. And thought you were in high cotton with high tech equipment. Actually, no. I, I'm gonna, I thought we were fairly unsophisticated. Okay. I thought if we ever really got challenged anything serious, we were in trouble. We, we fortunately had a prosecutor's investigator who was a Vietnam era Green Beret who saved our bacon, a fellow by the name of Steve Longo. He's since passed away. But if it wasn't for Steve, I think we would have been in serious trouble. Okay. How did he help? He made us realize our deficiencies and got us over our false confidence because it was real easy to put on that stuff and run around and you know do leapfrog stuff and take cover and do all that kind of stuff he's the one that brought us around to what really would transpire if we are kicking the door and rounds are fired in our direction and he uh, he was a bit like a drill instructor as far as when he took control of it and and made us realize it um, he kind of directed us to better training, um, introduced us to, to the, the special operations kind of mentality. Um, and, and, and I think he, I think he saved us. I think that's the best way to say it. I think he saved us. We, he, he kept us from hurting ourselves. Years ago, I went to a high risk warrant class. It was put on Safari Land was the training group that, that put it on. But the lead instructor was a Houston SWAT cop. And he said something that was very pivotal to me. And that was just because you've been doing it and getting away with it, you know, for so all this time doesn't mean you've been doing it right. Everybody you know, gets away with it quite well with a paper target, and a piece of steel, don't they? Right. Yeah, you know, he, he talked about how they've been doing entries. And they'd never had any opposition, so they thought they were doing it right. And then they had opposition one night and got a bunch of guys shot. And that's when they realized, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we're not doing this right. They don't think like we do. 
Right. They, they have their own mode of thought about it. We very seldom take it into account. I, I don't know how many cops I've talked to about talking to the people they arrest. And it's like, I ain't talking to that scumbag. Yeah. The greatest source of intelligence comes from your opponent. And um, they get a say. They get a say in how this stuff unfolds. I remember our first, what I call interactive training, was cotton wad revolvers. Basically a prime case with a talcum powder covered wad of cotton. And it would fly for about 12 or 15 feet and leave a little mark on you. There was no pain or anything, but it was feedback as to, wow, this is how easy you can get shot. And you know what? Those paper targets, they stand nicely still and you have a pretty good idea where they're going to be when you go in the door. Those people moving around, they change everything. Yeah, in the incident he, that they had got shot, he showed us a video of it, and the bad guy fired through a closed door. And, you know, I, I, and that's against the rules. That's against the rules. You know, I hear a lot of people put forth this whole notion that people won't shoot where they can't see. Um, I, right off the top of my head, I can think of five instances without doing any real research where bad guys shot through solid walls and doors at people. Bad guys will shoot through walls just out of panic. Just because they panic too. They just like us, they panic too. And they'll just unload on the wall. The, the idea, I think a lot of this comes from, and I believe it was a Georgia cop. You can correct me if I'm wrong. The traffic stop where he walks up to it and the guy comes around with the gun and he holds up his clipboard. And the guy moves his gun. He moves the clipboard. And, and you know, that's that's one of those famous stories that I don't even know if it's true or not, but it was quoted a lot. And suddenly it, it took on a whole life of its own. Well, bad guys won't shoot through things. Who says? Then my experience that bad guys shoot through things all the time, including cars and walls and doors and all kinds of stuff. It was us cops that didn't shoot through things because we were told not to do that. All right. We're supposed to follow the rules. We're supposed to follow the rules. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the, that's probably the big difference between combat and competition is rules. You know, there aren't any rules in a gunfight. Right. All right. Um, moving forward from this, this swatter, I know that you went to mid South a number of times right. and I'd, I'd like to hear about cool. mid South. I was introduced to Mid-South by a fellow named Ed Porter. He was the SWAT commander for the Cincinnati Police Department. I was either on the board or the vice president of the Ohio Tactical Officers at the time. And that's where I met Ed. And Ed had taken Cincinnati's SWAT team to Mid-South. Ed hosted the couple of the guys from Mid-South at the Cincinnati Police Range. And I went up there for a three-day abbreviated version of their five-day class and, and took that. And that was my introduction to what was referred to as the surgical speed shooting. You know, it was the hard, locked-out isosceles, you know, shooting very fast but very accurate, uh, shooting a large number of rounds, uh, you know, like a 1,000 rounds a day three inch dots, six inch dots, steel plates, steel plates that are moving, you know, plates while you're moving and, and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, the founder of Mid-South, John Shaw, who was the world speed shooting champion, he told people, he said, I'm not teaching you how to fight this. I'm teaching you how to shoot. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the special operations community at that time asked for that very specific subject matter. They felt like they could handle mindset. They could handle tactics. They had all that stuff down pat. What they wanted was a course of instruction in shooting very, very fast, very, very accurate. They would handle the tactical aspects. And that's where John Shaw was at the right place at the right time with his Mid-South facility because he taught exactly that. And he very quickly got a huge clientele, which as far as I know, goes on to this day. Because I don't think you can just sign up for a class at Mid-South. I think it's you, you gotta be at a unit or a team or something like that. And when it came to shooting very fast and very accurate, it was the best school I ever went to. 
um, after that three day class, I went down to Lake Kaman Moran. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, south of, uh, of Memphis. And I took the five day class three times. And basically what it was, it was the same program, but you did it with 20% less time and then you did it in full kit and, and all that kind of stuff. But you would go down there for five days and shoot a thousand rounds a day. And when you left there, you could run that pistol. I mean, you really, really could. And it was the best shooting class that I ever went to, but it was not a gunfight program. Program. You were expected as an individual or as a team to take what you learned there and adapt it to gunfighting. And that's where a lot of people really drop the ball because they missed that component, which the special operations community took for granted. They were going to handle their own mindset, their own tactics, their own use of cover. They wanted that very specific thing. And a lot of teams went down there and took that, thought they were ready, and they weren't. It was merely a component of gunfighting. Shane Gosa uh, and I did some research into the guys that were the founders of the firearms program at the Georgia Public Safety Training Center. And the two common elements with them were uh, Shaw's Mid-South and Rogers. Mm -hmm. And they taught that very hard locked out what the competition guys derisively call the tactical turtle now. And that's what was drilled into me, at, you know, starting in 1999 and moving forward. And I stayed with that uh, until 2014. I went to the Rogers Shooting School, which is, you know, you go on Sunday night for your first lecture and then you shoot you know, Monday through Friday. And then I did an open enrollment class with Ken Hackathorn on Saturday and Sunday. You must have been tired. I was, and I came back and I had scheduled in service with our guys two days that following week because I wanted to roll right out of those classes and jump right mm -hmm. into stuff with our guys and by Thursday of the next week I couldn't move my left elbow <laughs> I'm not I'm not surprised I'm and, not surprised I'm really not and that's when I decided you know what um maybe I need to start looking at something else and that's when I, you know, found the, you know, put a little bend in your elbows and it forms the shock absorber and you don't get that. You well, know. I've had both of my elbows redone, rebuilt, right. and I'm convinced it was the years of locking, at, locking in behind it. Um, in the back of my mind, I knew it wasn't right. I knew that I could, I could control the recoil just as well with unlocked elbows, not necessarily bent, but unlocked elbows. But you know that was the methodology, and I and I went along went along with it, and and it was a it was a mistake that one of the many mistakes I've made over the years, and many of the things I had to unlearn. Uh, you know, you, you talk about how you had to do that through four systems. Thankfully, I only had to do it through two. No, and uh, long haul, isn't it? Yes, it is. And occasionally now, when I get pressed or I get tired. I will find myself resulting, you know, reverting right back to it because that's yeah. the strongest motor program in my, in my computer. And yeah, if I really, if I got to have this one, sometimes I revert back to it. We well, see the younger, the younger guys now that are just coming up, the, the, the YouTube trainers, Instagram trainers, the young guys, they're very fortunate. They don't realize how fortunate they are that we now know how to do this. Uh -huh. And it's the only way they know. And they're the benefactors of that methodology. They didn't have to learn by trial and error what you and I had to learn by trial and error. They, they pretty much got it down. And that's a, that's a real advantage that I'm not sure many of the young guys grasp. You know, before I went to that Rogers class, uh, the, the State Public Safety Training Center has what we call a Rogers range, a similar concept, just on a different different target array. And there was a class they have called Semi-Automatic 2. And you spent one of the days of that class on the, quote, Rogers range. Mm -hmm. And the class is a very good class. I think it's actually better than some of them that have higher numbers down there. Mm -hmm. And that one day on that Rogers range, I discovered reset during recall on my pistol 
And I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I came back telling all the other guys at the, at the, at the age, Hey guys, you realize you can actually reset the, 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 the trigger during recall. Nobody told me I actually, I stumbled upon it because we've been taught to hold it to the rear and let it forward. And somehow it just accidentally happened. And I come back all excited about it. And people are like, shut up, Wings. I don't want to hear it. And so I was doing it for years without telling anybody else anything else about it. And suddenly that's a thing on the internet. Well, if you go to an instructor that says, I'm going to, I'm going to decrease your split times dramatically, all they're going to do is teach you reset and recovery. Um, that, I mean, that is, that is the, really the only way to in, in, increase your split times. Uh, and you just work it and work it and work it. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, the smaller caliber pistol you got, the easier it is to do. And, you know, if you really want to run your splits fast, you shoot a nine millimeter, you don't shoot a 45 or a 40. That's just, that's just physics. But um, the, the, pull and pin or trapping the trigger or uh, holding it against the frame, all of the various phrases that that technique has been called, it kind of reminds me of position Sewell. You know, position Sewell was done for a very specific reason. And for that reason, it was actually a pretty brilliant, a brilliant technique. But because it was truly unique, it suddenly became a ready position. You know, people are searching buildings with their fending hand trapped underneath their pistol, and it, it, it took on a life of its own that it shouldn't have. Well, pulling and pinning or trapping the trigger was the same way because it was a relatively easy way to teach people how to control the trigger, but it was never intended to be a trigger control technique. It was intended to be a technique to pe teach people excuse me, to teach people to go from a double action to a single action trigger. You know, the, the SIG 226, the Beretta 92, the, the third generation Smith & Wessons and stuff like that. You had a long first trigger and then an incredibly short trigger. And there's a lot of in, misinformation out there. Well, you know, uh, cops with the double action guns, they missed that first shot. Not originally, not initially, we didn't miss them at all. We were coming from revolvers that had a long trigger every time. You didn't worry about trigger reset because the trigger kicked your finger back out. So the initial long trigger was something that people were used to. They hit that shot. The one they missed was all of a sudden, they let their finger go all the way back out here, but the trigger was sitting here. So they snatched trying to get back to the trigger and they ran the gun low shot down, you know, shooting target stands at 15 feet, stuff like that. So we came up with a methodology to teach him to do this. And that's where it came from. You press the trigger, you let the gun fire, holding it to the rear, and then you let it out to feel the shorter trigger, and then you pressed it off. But as soon as they got this, 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 then you taught them to do it while recovering in recoil. Somewhere along the way, that was that phase of it was forgotten because it was real easy. But all you've got to do is understand what a gunfight is. And this is where I realize a lot of people do not. Someone is shooting back at you. That's why it's called a fight, a gun fight, an exchange of rounds. You're on target. You're prepared to shoot this guy to save your life or someone you care about. And you're, here you are, and you're going to let your finger out like that to fire the gun? Does that make any lick of sense at all? No. I mean, because let's face well, it's just this, Dave. It's not a big deal. Well, we all understand that digital dexterity goes into the dumper. So it isn't going to, it's going to be, it's going to be something like this. And it's actually a way that someone could get themselves hurt or killed in a gunfight. Why would you want to be on target and not ready to shoot this guy? All right. Makes no sense. Yeah, I so, think it's go ahead. And no, I mean any instructor that's teaching the combat if you want to when you're competing, do the trigger however you want. I'm talking about a fight here. I'm talking about a combative application, handgun combatives. I'm talking about fighting with a pistol. You don't want to be on target, ready to shoot, and not be able to press the trigger. 
having to let the trigger out to press it, it it's it's biomechanically unsound. You know, I think instructors that that miss taught that, you know, the further away you get from the original source of information, it's like that whole game that they played in school where they would tell somebody, you know, on one side of the room something and like pass it all around the room. The yeah, around. You know, to see how it would change. You know, cops, are, we're notorious for sending someone to a one week school and they consider them the expert. And when they come back to the agency, you get what they remember from the 40 hour class that they went to or the 80 hour class that they went to. It's not the same as you going to that class from the original source material. And I think mm -hmm. over time you get a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and eventually, you know, parts of it fade out and we're just not seeing that. And I don't think that's one of those things that the original proponents of that technique, as you were saying, and I've seen your video, where you read from the manual, that that was just to teach the steps to get to this other point and Not somewhere like the finger all the way out like you right. did with the revolver yeah to get you to go long short long right. short long short that was all that was for and it, and it took off a life of its own yep. you know one of the things that we seem to have lost the ability to do is ask why when i was a young uh, copper instructor coming up it was nothing unusual to like well wait a minute why are we doing this what's the purpose behind it because when you find out the cause or reason behind something, you're much more likely to go along with it. And you'll certainly teach it better. You'll certainly pass it along better because you understand the reasoning behind it. But now in the age of celebrity instructors, and, and I can say this kind of stuff now because I'm leaving, but in the age of celebrity instructors, well, you'll do it because that's the way I teach it. We're not allowed to ask why. Well, you know what? If I'm not allowed to ask why, you're not going to be my instructor. I'm going to go somewhere else. Because you need to know, you need to understand, you need to have every understanding of how this will help save your life. And if you don't have that understanding, if you're just going along like, you know, you're marching along to the tune of the famous guy, then you're an idiot. I mean, you're, you're just, you're, you're stupid. You're not wise. You should understand why this benefits you, why you're going to take all this time to incorporate this into your motor programs to a, a level that you can do it without thinking about it. That's a long process. It's a lot of effort. You should understand why it's important to you. And we seem to have lost that. And I think a lot of, well, that's painting with a broad brush, but it probably is applicable is so-called instructors don't know the why. No, they do not. They go to school, they come back, they teach what they know. And that's unfortunate. And, you know, I'll even point the fingers back at myself. You know, I went to the, my first firearms instructor school in 2003 and I came back and I knew how to call a course of fire and how to grade targets. I was getting ready to retire in 2000. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, they didn't spend any time on that on actually teaching people how to shoot. And then I'm getting sent to the to the range with people who are about to fail out of the academy. We'll go get this guy through the, you know, through the academy. And, you know, the answer to every question was stop jerking the trigger. You quit and, slapping the trigger. Yeah. And I'm sitting there knowing tight, this isn't right. Press, tight press. <laughs> yep. Okay. And so I began searching for there's got to be a better way to do this than well, what I've been well, taught instructor classes you go to where you, you shot a lot of drills and you were graded but nobody ever taught you how to teach the drill how to look for the things the person is doing wrong uh, that kind of stuff you, you all these instructor certifications out there that are going on and it's mostly just running through some instructor's drills the stuff he likes but seldom are people teaching you how to teach, how to explain. I don't know how many classes I have gone to. And I, I didn't expect that I would learn anything new because there's only so many ways to shoot a gun. I think I've seen them all now. But looking for a better way to say it, mm -hmm. uh, a, a phrase that will get that light bulb to go off in that person's head, to get that aha moment, that those are the nuggets that gets us instructors excited. 
Yep. You know what I mean? That's that's the stuff that we like. That that uh, and that's lost on a lot of people, I'm afraid. Yep. I, I was uh, uh, very amused or I guess gratified the other day when I mentioned a term on something immediately got a text message from you. What's that? And uh, Bloom's taxonomy. And then we, we traded like seven text messages back and forth over that. I, I, I had I understood the concept, but I had never seen that diagram. I had never seen it explained that way. And that was wonderful. I learned something new. It was it was terrific. It got me all fired up. I was telling people about it. Um, you know, the, the message behind it, I, I, I grasped. I knew that. But I wished I had had seen that diagram mm -hmm. and stuff before. That was that was terrific. Thank you for that, by the way. You're welcome. Uh, circling back around to your path and your training, uh, any other mentors that you would like to honor here? Many. If you've ever seen my book, Handgun Combatives, you'll see that the acknowledgement page is three pages long because there's just a huge number of people that I thank. Um, you know, I said Ken Hackathorn. Uh, another one would be Kelly McCann. Kelly McCann, who was writing under the name of Jim Grover, was the person that, that, that made me understand that the difference between a teacher and an instructor was someone who looked at the, at the problem at hand, understood it well enough to create their own methodologies, to create their own solutions to the problems, where an instructor just goes off and then comes back and recycles what they learned with no real understanding of it. Uh, Kelly is a very technical uh, person, a very technical instructor. And a lot of the things he teaches, he developed himself. And I appreciate that because I, I like to think that a lot of the things I teach, I develop myself too. I mean, there may have been somebody else parallel that was doing the same thing, but I, I had original thoughts behind it because I understood how the human body worked and what happened in conflict. But Kelly would be another big one. Masada Yu. Masada Yu, there's a lot of people that, you know, that poo-poo him and, and throw him off to the side. But he may be the master presenter. He's the guy that, because as you well know, you've got about a minute and a half to grab people's attention. Uh -huh. Or they're on their phone or they're daydreaming or something like that. Masada Yu gets in there and boom, he takes control of the class right away. John Farnham and his understanding of history and how to apply it to current lessons uh, was another person. Bill Gross from the Ohio Peace Officer Trading Academy, who's now deceased. He was another big one for me. Um, certainly John Shaw and his staff at Mid-South. Uh, George Harris and the old SIG Arms Academy was another one. Um, Ed Stock, Giles Stock, um, Illing New, um, all of the folks at Gunsight that I got the opportunity to train under. Clint Smith. Clint Smith is, is a brilliant man. Uh, uh, the way he can mix humor and seriousness and get across the message is just unbelievable. His understanding of the rifle and how to use it in urban environments is probably second to none. Um, holy smokes. Uh, Luciota, um, his understanding of the Applegate Sykes, a lot of people give it to Fairbairn, but it was really Eric Sykes that did the point shooting. You know, Lou took me through the whole concept of point shooting and how to merge it with sighted fire, because it's not either or, it's both. You got to have an understanding of both. Um, so there's a lot of people along the way, Lou Alessi and holsters, you know, everybody just thinks a holster is just a pouch to put your gun in, but Lou made me understand how a good combat holster should be designed, the features it should have. Um, boy, there's, there's so many, I mean, I, I think back on the last 40 years of my life and the people that helped me get to where I am right now. And, and they're immense. There's just any number of them. Uh, I, I mentioned Gunsight and didn't mention Jeff Cooper. Uh, I mean, he's kind of the guy that started all this. There seems to be a cottage industry these days in slamming Jeff Cooper. Jeff Cooper, his old ways are, well, <laughs> let, me, let me clarify something to you here, buddy. Okay, all you naysayers out there, let me ask you something. When you teach a class in pistol craft, do you teach grip? Do you teach trigger? Do you teach stance? 
Do you teach a ready position or a muzzle diversion position? Do you teach drawing from the holster? Do you teach a reload? Do you clear stoppage clearance? Well, if you're teaching it that methodology, then you're teaching Jeff Cooper's original defensive pistol class that he developed in the 1950s and then brought through the 1960s and, and all that kind of stuff. But that format was mm -hmm. Jeff Cooper's and everybody else follows it. So if you're thinking, I never do anything Jeff Cooper way, well, you better not be teaching your class with that format because you're teaching Jess Cooper's methodology. And quite frankly, Cooper borrowed some of that from Sykes and Applegate because, you know, they also, you know, did, you know, they didn't call it a ready position, but that jack handle where they lift the gun up to, that's kind of like our low ready. And mm -hmm. they really didn't teach trigger control. They just teach you to tap the trigger because, you know, they were all single action guns, you know, the 1903 380s or the 1911 pistol and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, everybody influences everybody along the way, you know, I, I always like to say firearms instruction is kind of an exercise in espionage because we're all looking for different ways to do things and add to it. And that is absolutely okay. As long as you give attribution, what I don't like in this day and age is all these young guys that are out there stealing people's stuff and trying to make people think they, they thought of this. This was my idea. You lion sack of crap. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm off my soapbox. I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm back down again. So yeah, but there's been, there's been so many people, you know, where Dave spawning came from and where handgun combatives and all that, it, it wasn't just me. There was a lot of people behind it that inspired me and pushed me along, but also I'm going to, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I came up with a lot, well, not a lot, but I came up with some of my own stuff and I incorporated it into my own and I de developed my own methodology and even though a lot of times it was attacked, I stood by it. So I, I'm kind of I'm kind of there too. So, um, but I'm also a realist enough that if Lee Weem showed me something better tomorrow, I would jettison what I was doing and I would I would go to what you're doing. All right. So now that handgun combatives is, is riding towards the proverbial sunset. What do you want most remembered about Dave Spaulding and the handgun combatants methodology? I don't know. I just think if someone remembered, remembered Dave Spaulding, that would be nice. Because in an age when we have so many instructors out there, so many people trying to make that national level, that um, just being remembered will be enough. I think, though, if I have to have a legacy issue, I would hope that Dave Spalding taught the combative application of the pistol. He just didn't teach people to shoot. He taught them how to fight. He taught them how to be better prepared, how to take responsibility for themselves, how to be an active participant in their own rescue, to, to be better, to, to excel, to be prepared, um, that he, he did the best he could to make you more ready. I think I think I would like that. Uh, that's an awful lot to put on my tombstone. But uh, if, if I'm remembered as someone who did the best they could to enhance the com to, to enhance combative pistol craft, then that'll be enough. Well, I'll say this is one of your your students and one of your certified guys now. Which thank you for that, by the way. Um, you earned it. You know. Uh, thank you. We had a, a couple of other certified instructors got a little bent about that. You know, they came for a week and, and you took every class I offered, some of them twice, and you traveled great distance to do it. And then I sat and I watched you teach for three days as a student. If there was anybody that deserved that certification, my friend, it was you. Well, thank because you, I consider you one of the I consider you and people like you the future of combative firearms training. You, John Hearn, your generation, you guys are the ones that are going to carry this mantle along. And, and I was very proud to give you that certificate. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, when I think of handgun combatives and all of the methodology and everything, the, the part that sticks with me is the most important thing 
in the gum fight is getting the gum between you and the bad guy. And the paperweight I, for that, isn't it? I often repeat that on the range with attribution, of course, but it's more than just the draw. It's everything else that's involved. If you are clearing a malfunction, you've, the gun's not between you and the bad guy in any usable form until you clear the malfunction and get it back, the working end back towards the bad guy. If you're doing a reload, if you're having to move uh, with purpose and get into another position. And, and hurt the muzzle because you're going around people. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, all of that is getting the gun between you and the bad guy. And to me, that's the methodology. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's, that's a good way to look at it as anything. It's because it, until you get the gun between you and the third, it's a paperweight. But presentation is more than just drawing from the holster. It, anytime you deliver the gun to the threat, it's a presentation. And it has to be done deliberately not quickly. It needs to be done deliberately in an age where everything is go fast, go fast, go fast. We have lost the understanding that the gun has to arrive at a very specific location or it's not useful. There is a very small part of the chest cavity, but you know, it's, it's about the width of your head. It goes down to your sternum and it, and it connects up to your neck to your, it's a very small place. And even within that space, things like the heart, the aorta, the major vessels, um, the, the part of the brain that will create incapacitation are very, very small places. If you are going to make use of bullet placement to low cases, you have to put the gun there in usable fashion. It's not driving the gun. It's not running the gun. It's placing the gun. It's delivering the gun. It's being very deliberate in your action. And that presentation has to be very, very specific. But then once you get it there, you've got to depress the trigger in such a way that you don't take the gun off the target. Because even though the sight may arrive where, where you want it, you may shoot him in the love handle because you did something with your hand. So that is probably a very big message of handgun combatives. And it it's very gratifying that you grasp that so well. I, I, that's, that's why you're an instructor. Well, thank you. You know, I was on the range not too long ago as a student in, a, in another instructor's class. And this was nobody big name. This is the agencies type stuff. And they were very big on the speed and they were teaching you know, the escalator presentation to, to the target. And, you know, I'm going to jump in the middle of somebody else's class and no, 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 whatever. Uh, afterwards, I was just talking to a couple of the other guys in the class. And, you know, guys, how do you get to every call that you go on? And you're like, what do you mean? I said, how do you arrive at every call that you go on? Well, I drive. I get the radio call and I, I drive there. So you're seating in a vehicle with the steering wheel in front of you and you got your MDT and everything over here. Can you do that escalator draw from that position? And I was sitting there thinking, I said, so why practice a technique that's not going to work for you in every position? But I don't know if you drive the elbow to the rear as far as it'll go, grab the pistol, lift it up to the elbow won't bend anymore and then press straight out guess what you clear all of that yeah the lunch right. counter you're sitting behind the desk you're, yeah all of that stuff yeah and so why well, not you, just do it that way all the time well what we what we seem to have lost in translation to go fast is and, and again this is part of the combative application speed is not from the holster to where you can press off the shot Speed is from the holster to where the gun is useful. And that's a big difference because at a gunfight that's happening at two or three feet, you're not going to be able to press out. The gun's going to have to come up. It's going to have to turn into a position where it is useful. And let, let's, since we're talking about this, let's talk a, a really briefly. I know you may have to go. We've been going a long time. You know, the whole concept of draw speed, the concept of reload speed, the concept of split speed, 
you know, that is a competitive application and in combat it's useful, or I mean in competition it's useful. But in combat, speed of draw, speed of reload, all of those things are totally misunderstood. Because it's not the speed of the draw that's going to save your life or the speed of the reload or the, the clearance. The time that's going to get you hurt or killed is the time it takes for you to recognize the threat and realize you've got to institute that draw, that reload, that stoppage clearance. Because you may have a one second draw, but if you've got three seconds of lag time that requires you to, to comprehend what's going on before you initiate that draw, now it's not a one second draw, it's a four second draw, it's a five second draw. So what people should be working on is not draw speed, reducing their lag time. Because if you can't reduce your lag time to recognize the threat, then your draw speed or your reload speed or your stoppage clearance speed is going to be not relevant. And how many people in a class do you see waste the unexpected stoppage, the unexpected reload, the unexpected draw stroke? They stand there and they look at their gun because they're more concerned about it. It's broken. Why did it stop? instead of tap racking it or reloading it and getting back into the fight, you know, they're more concerned about their equipment than using that very wonderful, unexpected stoppage or gun uh, need, so to speak. Because that, that right there is the speed you need to work on reducing, not the draw. And anyone who truly understands the combative application of the pistol will understand that is more important than how fast you deploy the gun. Exactly. Before I ask my closing question, along those lines, I got to ask you to tell everybody about the high noon drill. Oh, <laughs> in the interactive pistol class. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was my most canceled class. Because what we did in, in interactive pistol is it was a two day class. And in the first day, we did live fire drills, time drills, time draw, time to reload and all that kind of stuff. And then for the second half of the first day and then most of the second day, we did that stuff against each other. And one of the first things we did, I called the high noon drill because it was like the movie High Noon. It was literally two guys standing about 15, 18 feet apart. They both had their gun in the holster. They both knew what was coming, right? And what I would do is I would take the person who had the fastest draw from day one and the slowest draw from day one. So I got these two people. This guy over here may have, yeah, he may have been one, one or one, two. And this guy over here was more like, two seconds and you could tell when they stood up there that the guy had the fastest draw you know he was and the guy that had the slower draw was like but when it was time to go they would both draw and you know who got shot both of them because three quarters of a second is only slow on the face of the electronic timer in the reality of conflict it's infinitesimal I heard somebody say one time, who wants to be two tenths of a second behind in a gunfight? <laughs> Don't matter. You're still going to get shot. Two tenths is, is nothing. If you're going to redirect the outcome of a fight, you've got to be seconds ahead. Seconds. Tenths of a second are very unlikely to change the outcome. You would have to drill the guy in the Abdullah or maybe drill him right through the aorta to get that kind of a rapid response. There's a real good chance that you're not going to get that. And even if they do decide to quit, it's probably not going to happen in two, three, four tenths of a second. You won't, you won't recognize that they're stopping that fast. Yeah, I, I think it's greatly missed that it takes the same amount of time to stop an action that you've already started as it does to start an action. That, that, that happens on the back end as much as it happens on the front end. Well said. 
Well and said. That's why we have shots in the back and shots over people's heads as they're falling and everything else. Well, you know, you always think, you know, two, three tenths of a second, that's a long time. You'll ask people, well, how long's the blink of an eye? Well, that's fast. It's about three tenths of a second. So if you're thinking that one second versus 1.3 is a big deal, it is literally the blink of an eye. You can't look at someone and see a one second draw versus a one and a half second draw. Your eyes won't pick up that small amount of speed. It won't happen. The only way you can know the difference is to look at the electronic timer. Yep. All right, so our, my closing question. You have the soapbox at the pulpit <laughs> and you get to preach the sermon to send all of us firearms instructors out into the world. Where do we need to go? What do we need to do? I, I'd like to think that we've just been doing that for the last hour, however long we've been talking. Right. I guess when it comes to instructors, you know, there's so many out there now, so many. I, I remember talking to Ken Hackathorn again. And, you know, when he was in this in the mid 1980s, he said there was like two or three fixed schools and probably maybe 10 guys that were traveling the country at a national level. I'll bet you there's a two or three fixed locations in every state. And there's probably a hundred people who are working at that national level of traveling back and forth. And that doesn't count the regional guys and the local guys. And they can say what they want, but all them regional and local guys, they want to be national level trainers. So there's a lot of people out there doing this. So my message to those people is first, what is it you want to do? What, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to teach people how to shoot? Great. Do that well. Understand the human physiology and the biomechanics and the whys behind that. If you're trying to teach them how to fight with a pistol or a carbine or a shotgun, truly understand what it is you're trying to deliver. Because fighting and shooting, though they encompass some of the same skills, are not the same thing. A perfect example would be that escalator draw versus drawing to a, piece, a, a retention position and then going straight out, that upside down L draw that I talk about. That would be a competitive draw versus a combative draw. So understand the difference. Those little things are the differences between winning a fight and just shooting well. So understand what you're trying to accomplish. If you're just trying to teach shooting, great. If you're trying to teach the combat, the competitive application, perfect, go forth. If you're trying to teach the combative application, then understand what happens in a fight. And that's going to require more than just watching a bunch of videos. And I'm not slamming anybody. I, I'm not going after anyone. But, you know, we have a lot of people now that just watch YouTube and Live Leak and think they've developed, you know, expertise. And that's not the case. Um, you need to understand what is going on. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I know of a guy that suddenly started teaching a home defense and, and part of that clearing rooms as part of his curriculum. He's never done that in real life. He's, he's, never, he's never cleared a room. Have you ever actually done this? Well, no, but the principles are the same. No. <clears throat> the principles and the actual application of it are not the same. Yeah, it's one thing to teach how to go a route and all that kind of stuff. It's a whole lot different to teach that when someone's shooting back at you. Because as you and I both know, because we have done that for real, mm -hmm. when someone starts to counter your action, everything goes in the dumper. Well, okay, Scooter, what do you do now? If you don't have answers to that, then you're not a combative firearms instructor. So understand what you're trying to do. Understand what your real world of work is, what you're trying to accomplish and go at it, but understand it completely. Understand the whys, you know, dig into the, into the, into the weeds of, of human biomechanics and physiology and why the body does what it does and, and things like that. I would say one of the biggest advantages I had is, you know, I came out of college with a degree in sports physiology, so I understand human movement and performance. And I remember very early on, it made me question a lot of the things that were taught traditionally. 
And we've talked about that. I won't get into the weeds on that. But um, if you have a, a solid understanding of how the body best works, then you're probably going to have a better understanding in how to deliver that information. Did I say that well? Yes. Did I? Yeah. Okay. So um, my final word, and then I'll leave you go, is this is too important. If you're teaching people how to save their lives or the lives of someone they care about, it's not about you making money. It's not about you getting famous. It's not about you getting a lot of followers or likes or any of that other stuff. That is not important. What's important is your student and you delivering them the best information you can because they're going to rely their life on it. Hopefully it will never happen, but if it does, they're going to fall back to what you taught them. And if you taught them crap, they're going to perform crap. And they're probably going to get seriously injured or lose their life. And that's something that I could not live with. I don't know if you ever had, but I've had people I have trained who have been killed. It's not something I want anybody to ever happen because you always wonder what you could have done to make it better. I mean, the, the, the situations vary so greatly, probably nothing, but you still think about it. Yep. And if it happens to you, you want to be able to say, well, you know, I did the best I could. I wasn't just trying to do something flashy, trendy, cool looking because I wanted them to watch my video or pay me money. That would make you a scoundrel. Yep. Absolutely. And there's nothing like seeing somebody perform well with something you've taught them and they prevail in a bad situation. When you get that person call you on the phone and say, what you taught me saved my life, it is one of the best days you possibly could have. I have been blessed with a, a sizable number of those over the decades. Yep. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Yeah. Well, Dave, I, I want to thank you for your mentorship over these past few years. And I hope it's going to continue even though you're not out on the, on the road anymore. Uh, I still plan on bending your ear at every opportunity. Oh, you know, it's like I've told a lot of my instructors and hosts over the years, I didn't die. <laughs> a lot of people make this sound like I died. You yeah. know, I, I probably shouldn't even have said retired. You know, I'm still going to be out there. I'm going to teach a little bit here and there. I'm shutting down my company. I don't want to run a business anymore, but I'll still be around. And I, I yeah. hope I hear from you. I hope I hear from people along the way. Because, you know, that it's good to hear feedback, you know, how things are going. It's just, I don't want to live in hotels and airports anymore. Yeah, people that haven't done that just don't realize how much of a strain it is. They, they really don't. You know, um, when I started the business, the one thing my wife asked me was, don't go out on a route, come home when you're done. Because, you know, a lot of guys do that. They go out mm -hmm. on a two or three week route and that would be more efficient. But my wife wanted me to come home and try to live as a, a much of a normal life as I could in between classes. So there was a lot of Monday, get off the plane, Friday, get back on it. That got old pretty fast. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm glad you did it. Um, I, I, haven't, I have enjoyed the, the, uh, the mentorship and the camaraderie and, and everything that I've learned and, you know, that I get to pass that along to, to my guys and, um, know that as long as I'm still doing this, what I've taken from handgun combatants will still be alive and will still be preached forward. And hopefully somebody will pick that up and continue it when I get done. That's all we can ask. And I appreciate you being such a staunch supporter of this. Um, Cause I, I know you're a range master instructor that you've worked really, really well with Tom Givens, who is one mm -hmm. of the one of the best in the business and, and to be mentored by him as well is just, uh, is just excellent. So the fact that you've also decided to, to adopt some of my stuff, that means a lot to me. Well, thank you. Yeah. If it works, use it. Indeed. There you go. Well, to the audience, uh, I thank you. Uh, we are continuing to grow. We set a, a record this past week on the, uh, 
all-time high for the 30-day average of episodes. We topped that 300 mark. And so thank you. And as always, we ask you to share the links with your smart friends, but not share it with the dumb ones because uh, we don't want them tagging along. They just take up space and, and, and steal air from the rest of us. But uh, most importantly, everyone, thank you for your time. <laughs>